The queue will now initiate. Welcome to episode number 111 of the Curve the Cube podcast. It's your host, Jemmy. And on this episode, I continue to take you with me on my own journey of curving the cube, catch up with musician Charles Milling, and dive into three curvest centered challenges. Ooh. <laughs> to start, you'll hear as I captured my own stream of thought one morning. Just a matter of days after PodFest, when two major opportunities jumped in my face and I had to exhaustively act. (laughs) This walk was the first time I'd had to pause, step back, breathe, and just process the days I spent at PodFest and how impactful on my career that experience really was. And with a couple of other impromptu recordings, I share two other aha moments that are pretty, sorry Gerard, Amazing! (laughs) So, Charles Milling, solo artist and live hymnal band leader, previously featured on episode 13. We talk a bunch about Live Hymnal's latest album, Procession, and also dive into some totally cursing topics like dealing with industry challenges and changes that you never saw coming. The challenge of getting people to say, I must have that about your unique thing. And as a creative, knowing when it's okay to end the pursuit of a project perfection. If you haven't met Chuck in our previous episode, get ready to meet an absolutely visionary musician, endearing optimist, and dear friend of mine. In fact, the day prior to this recording, (laughs) recording this intro, I should say, he did something extraordinarily sweet and special for my little boy, his godson, that is forever cemented into our memory. My longtime listeners will notice quite a difference in format on this episode as I'm trying to bring you guys more, including a new segment I'm calling The Learning Curve, where I share specific actionable items, tips, tricks, and pieces of advice for you to put into play as you curve your own cube. So buckle up for a pretty packed episode, guys. And if you're in Palm Beach, Florida... And want to learn more about podcasting, head to palmbeachpodcasters.com. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get this party started. I want everybody to put your hands up, make some noise as we welcome the fabulous Jemmy! Hey guys, I'm on my morning walk again. Um, It's been an eventful two days. I'm having further thoughts because I'm currently messaging on Facebook with Glenn, i.e. Glenn the Geek, i.e. Glenn Herbert, i.e. Um, Horse Radio Network, i.e. My New Mentor, while I was just listening to an episode of Horses in the Morning. In the last 48 hours since I've gotten back from PodFest, I had two main, main things I had to attend to all of a sudden. One was, of course, I wanted to keep my promise to Glenn, which meant I needed to get my episode ready and edited by the first. I had three days, I think. Not normally a problem. For my typical episode, wouldn't be an issue. But for this episode, it was a big issue because there was so much raw audio that I had to clean up first. And I had to leave some stuff on the table you know, just for time, because I think the first night, which was um, Sunday night, I edited for about four and a half hours. And then Monday night, I edited, well, I went to sleep early because I was so exhausted the night before, woke up at one thirty, and edited straight through the morning until I had to leave to take my son to school and head to my client's office. So... I think it ended up being about 12 hours worth of editing. And like I said, I still left some, some, a little gunk on the floor. I might, might go back and have to clean it up a little bit more. But I wanted it out at 6 a.m. on the 1st. I wanted to honor my commitment and my promise to Glenn and prove to him that I'm serious about this. So the fact is, I finished editing primarily till before I got out the door yesterday morning. Uh, I had uploaded it to my Google Drive, listened to it during the course of the morning, wrote down a few notes, and went back and cleaned up um, the more significant issues later in the afternoon. So I really, really finished yesterday early, early afternoon. 
I was so tired when I went to sleep last night that I, I haven't had a chance to really think about much of anything else, you know, like really think about my experience again and let it like sink in. But it was important that I got it ready. And I was really, really proud of myself and relieved that I got all of that done. The second thing that was a big, big deal was um, Sunday, I, w- I received a message from Jared Easley, i.e. the co-founder of Podcast Movement. You heard him a lot and heard me talk about him a lot on episode 110. Uh, he messaged me, encouraging me to submit myself to be a presenter at Podcast Movement at the end of August in Anaheim, California. This is a podcast convention I was already super excited about attending. So for him to message me and ask me to submit myself to be a presenter was just, wow. (laughs) So I also had that to do. And I didn't, you know, having two days to come up with, um, oh, because that's the thing, the deadline was Tuesday. So I had two days (laughs) on top of editing the other episode. So I had to come up with some topics and I flesh, tried to flesh out three, landed on two. And sometime on Monday, I submitted them both. And he said, you should parlay this into your first Amazon best-selling book. I mean, <laughs> took my breath away. So I'm excited to see where, where that opportunity goes. But you know, these two major, major opportunities were, were had jumped in my face and I had to act. I had to take care of it. So, man, I was exhausted, you know, to be up at five o'clock in the morning now because of that, taking a walk and messaging with Glenn. And it's just really, really now sinking in as I'm going back and forth with him. How um, bulldog that was of me. How curvisty and bulldoggy that was of me to face these two huge tasks. Just look them in the face, say, I got this, and just do it. Just do it. Putting action behind my passion and just taking taking the bull by the horns and just doing it. So it's pretty exciting, guys. It's pretty exciting, everything that's going on. And uh, I have been working so hard, and I know the hard work in a lot of ways has only just begun. But I'm so excited about it and exhilarated, and I feel accomplished. This morning, I feel accomplished, so I just wanted to capture that morning with you guys, because if it wasn't for you guys, um, I wouldn't be here. So keep uh, keep curving your own cubes. Thanks for listening to these morning walk thoughts. (laughs) Okay, bye. Podfest was amazing. Awesome. Great. Amazing. So. Podfest. Yeah, buddy. Took my buddy to it. Oh, my so, yeah, you got to tell a, me about him. Yeah, Eric Merle. He, um, he's a live sound guy um, from New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, he stopped doing live sound, um, and he's just doing audio for podcasts. Uh, one of them is called Death the Podcast. And it's just Death a, the Podcast. Yeah. Oh. It's a, um, it's it a psychiatrist who's speaking to people who've had sort of post- death experiences no and have come back. No way. They're gaining some serious traction. No my way. My brother and I have the, the music at the beginning and the end. No way. I have myself and my brother. Stop it. Yeah. Oh my Very gosh. So everybody please check out Death the Podcast because apparently not including this because I want everybody to <laughs> listen to it. <laughs> it's cool. But we're here to talk about you, Chuck. Hey, okay. Yay. Enough about me. Uh, I'll ask you some questions. <laughs> so last time we sat down, uh-huh. It was like a year and a half ago. Can you believe it? I think yeah. something like that. Yeah. It was a while ago, maybe yeah, even longer, right. mm-hmm. maybe even longer. Oh my gosh, maybe even longer. Because I think it was episode thirteen. Mm-hmm. So we're on episode. This is episode ready. Yeah, one hundred eleven. So almost exactly hundred episodes later. Wow. I know. High Good five to you. us. Yeah, you're cooking. <laughs> so That's are you. Lot. I don't know. Yeah, oh, dude. So, okay, so let's just give a quick refresher for the listeners on, um, first of all, the Life Hymnal, like, project, the concept of it. Let's start Let's start there. Let's start there. Let's dive in right away to that. You got it. Yeah. Life, Life Hymnal is um, a project that essentially takes old hymns um, and rearranges them for band in mainline Christian churches. Yeah. So so you have uh, mainline churches, meaning like Episcopal, Methodist, Lutheran, 
um, these are churches that, you know, if you put praise and worship music in there, mm-hmm. it would be a little weird. It's just like a different ethos. Right. You know, they put a different emphasis on a different <laughs> syllable, and it comes out a little weird in an Episcopal church if right. all you're singing about is sin and feeling bad about yourself. Right. So Something would why. not fit. Right. It would feel really weird. Right. It probably wouldn't come back. <laughs> Yet, all these priests you know, these churches are aware, uh, and their vestries are aware that their congregations are shrinking yeah. and they're like, well, how do we get some, you know, younger, fresher vibes in here? And they start bringing in, you know, the, the token guitarist and, you know, it's a little weird and they're right. playing praise and worship and it's not really vibing. Right. Right. So what we set out to do um, a while ago is basically take our favorite hymns yeah. and to put great musicians to them and cool arrangements and to make it just, hip and accessible and fun and authentic to kind of who we are. Mm -hmm. But, but also, um, so we record those, we're two albums in, two books in. Um, and when I say books, we, we not only record, but we release the band charts and the lead sheets and. Which is just such another part of the endeavor. It's incredible. It's a a resource. We're trying to be a resource for churches that are just awakening to this. Um, thing called band music in traditional spaces. So yeah. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Um, our original concept was to do eight albums lickety split, like eight albums in five years. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> we started recording in 2012. We released our first album in 2013. And since then, it's where are we? 2017. Yeah. And we have one more album. Yeah. So, you know, the landscape in terms of how to make an album and afford it has changed drastically in a couple of years. Wow. So it's, you know, financially not not easy to do this project at right. this point. But right. We're, we're trudging ahead. What are some of the challenges that have come up that you never saw coming five years ago? Um, five years ago, people still bought CDs and yeah. cars were still made with CD players and CD players were still in houses. Yeah. So, you know, um, let me give you sort of a side-by-side comparison. Today, most people listen to our music via streaming mm-hmm. services like Spotify um, or uh, Rhapsody, so on and so forth. Right. Um, so for us to make what we would normally make from selling one CD, mm-hmm. we would have to stream 10, 15,000 streams. Wow. It would It would take 40 million streams to make another album. Now, at this point, wow. there is no shot in hell <clears throat> yeah. for us to attain 40 million streams. Because what I'm, when you say those yeah. those numbers, I'm thinking, okay, so a, a, a typical album might have between 10 and 15 songs. Songs, yeah. So if you're talking about 10 or 15,000 streams, you're talking about someone who would buy one album would have to listen to that whole album a thousand times to kind of equate to the kind of downloads that you're yeah. requiring without the actual album sale. You got it. Yeah. So, like, wow. think of think of your favorite album as a kid, right? <laughs> yeah. And how many times yeah. you spun that tape out of, you know, yeah. existence. I mean, you spun it over and over again, whether it was the record or the tape. And back then, that obsessive kind of listening right. actually was probably under 100 times. Right, you right, know? right, right. Well, for me, you know, yeah, yeah, I yeah. obsessed Even, over something. And at the time, there were far fewer options, and everybody kind of listened to the same, you know, generally yeah. speaking, the same thing. So. yeah. Those are big numbers. Totally. Yeah. So if you if you equate that to streams, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's paltry, uh, you know. So anyway, it's not yeah. it's no big deal. I'm not crying and spilled milk here. I'm just saying it's a different it's, landscape. It's now. flipped it big yeah. time. Most artists are doing it through patronage. Yeah, I was going to ask, how are you reacting? Like we have a patronage site, yeah. um, but uh, you know, it's also it's great. It's supported by people who really have a great heart for supporting but not necessarily right. by people who are fans which is really weird yeah. that's interesting yeah how do you determine the difference like is it just people in your personal life or extended network we have a lot of people might just who feel really like just care about yeah what we're the doing cause. and they're used to giving gotcha you know ah uh, that makes sense but um uh we also have a shit ton of fans yeah sorry about that it's okay we also have a ton of fans you can say whatever you want <laughs> We also have a ton Remember of fans. you're talking to. <laughs> I know. Uh, we also have a ton of fans yeah. um, who just don't, they don't give. They, they're not, it's yeah. not their thing to go that extra step 
yet they listen to us every day. Yeah. So I don't know how to cross that bridge. Yeah. But. Well, I'm figuring that out as well on my end. Yeah. <laughs> and as I come up with more tips and tricks, I will definitely share them with you. Awesome. Definitely. So I know that you're on the second um, album slash book of the live hymnal project. Yep. And procession. Procession. And I love it. Um, Thank you. You know, every time I listen to it, I, I don't know if it's because of my personal ties here and, and to those songs and mm. and the fact that I was on it and, you know, <laughs> I swear I can hear myself every once in a while. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but it was really cool to be a part of it. So it has a very special place in my heart Good. Um, for those reasons. But I try, I've tried to listen to it aside from that, too. It's mm. hard mm-hmm. because it is so tender to me. But... Mm-hmm. I've tried to listen to it aside from that, too. And it's just a damn good album. <laughs> it's just a damn good album. I mean, tell, tell the people what makes that different from the first album. Mm. Second album is more refined. Um, uh, just, um, uh, you know, the first album had a ton of just energy and, and like a wall of energy to mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Um and I had no clue how to record a choir. <laughs> so we recorded the choir in the church on that So you were experimenting, and experimenting just like I am right now. <laughs> yes, yes. Totally. Uh, um, we recorded that, that first congregation yeah. in, in its natural habitat. Yeah, I remember church. that. Yeah. I remember that. In the pews and, and everything, yeah. And that was really washy. Like, mm. it, it didn't come out so great, and it makes the lyrics very hard to hear. Um, and it was very hard to balance everything, mix the album. Yeah. Um, this one, like, we just got tighter, clearer. Um, I worked harder with the musicians, um, you know, getting them to compose with their thoughts, you know, between verses. So you'll hear a, a sax solo that's really well put together. Yeah. Um, a good piano solo that, you know... It might have taken Bob this time twenty takes instead mm-hmm. of me just taking his first two, which right. are always inspired. You know? Is that in part because um, you've gone a little stronger in the legs and in the voice of saying, "No, I want this perfection. I'm going to insist on." It, instead of, or did you like feel bad about asking too much at the time of the first album? Maybe, and maybe insist a little more. Maybe there's a little bit of that. Um, I think you know, just knowing how to how to have you know the language you develop the language yeah right you probably have this with podcasts yeah you have an intuition the first couple times around about what you want to say or ask for um but the language isn't there so you may or may not arrive at the thing you're going for Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, this time was able to get a lot closer and i think the next time even more. So. Well, I, I consider my first hundred plus episodes <laughs> as my album one. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully, this next hundred <laughs> is my album two. <laughs> and, I've, and I've grown a little bit. <laughs> yeah. In that time. It's funny. You may listen back to your your you know some of your first ones and find <gasps> some brilliance in there. Like, I just listened to a recording I produced in two thousand two. Yeah. And I swear it's the best sounding drums I've ever heard. No way. In recording anywhere. But I would never let you hear it because the way I produce the vocals makes me cringe. Oh, no. <laughs> and you don't have the separate the tracks separated anywhere? I, I do have the bed track. Okay. Yeah. And I might put it out there at some point. Oh, that'd be fun. Just because it sounds so good. Oh, Chuck. Um, you have to. But, uh, but, you know, you arrive at things by mistake sometimes and you have to really scratch your head and think back like damn did i take notes or you know what what really made that work and Absolutely. i actually hunted down that engineer um no that way I with that day in 2002 and um we talked extensively about how he set up the drums in that day and how he used this um room compression mic on a board through a dbx compressor and squashed <laughs> the crap out of it i mean like in in Doing it to two inch tape versus straight to digital. I mean, serious. Like, like he he yeah. really earns the title engineer. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, the guy remembers everything. Gosh, that's King, amazing. King Williams, he's he's amazing. He actually works for the um, uh, Grand Ole Opry. Now. Oh well, then never mind. So, <laughs> of course, <laughs> he will not he will not be engineering the next live. Uh, but maybe he'll engineer my second. Uh, you know, solo album. Yeah, I was going to ask you what's going on with your solo stuff, Chuck. I still write. 
Yeah. You know, you've had me in, in anticipation for a very long time because <laughs> you said, uh-huh. uh, you remember one of the songs that you and I connect the most on is Are You With Me? Yes. And you've said <laughs> that you have a follow-up song coming on soon. <laughs> That's the answer to that. Yes. I'm waiting, dude. <laughs> What's the answer? Oh, man, I really hope we can do that. Oh, please, yeah. please, please. Gosh, I've just got such a backlog. I know. It sucks having Imagine. ADD, being an artist. Yeah. And uh, having a backlog. Yeah. What's, I, the, what's the biggest part of your backlog? Is it the songs that you've written, things you want to get to? What do you mean when you say backlog? The, uh, the backlog is like, uh, you know, there's always the creative backlog where, yeah. like, most most guys or gals would, you know, on on Friday night through Sunday night, you know, during that time, they would, you know, fix the shit that's broken in their house and <laughs> do the chores right. and, like, you know, <laughs> attend to the emergency. Right. Like, my backlog is the music I would do during that time. Yeah. You know? Yes. Um, but in... Since I started Live Hymnal, I've worked seven days a week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I haven't had that time. Right. So I haven't even made demos for the, you know, like 80%, you know, created scratch tunes that I've made. Right, right. So it's all just like in a dustbin. Okay, so (laughs) I know what to get you for your birthday. (laughs) A cloning machine. (laughs) Basically, I need to get... I need to get live hymnal. Back to live hymnal. Yeah. Live hymnal originally was supposed to be eight albums, right? Yeah. If I can get the first four done, and we really have tested the market by that time, if there's a real, you know, uh, market for what we're doing, especially the resources, which will actually pay for more albums, um, then great. We continue. If not... I am going back to my damn music and giving it some time. You know know? what? Okay, so I had the weirdest thought about your music at the weirdest time. So just bear with me. But Uh it was while I was in Disney. It's okay, while I was in Disney. And it was like the middle of the night. The TV was on in the hotel. Mm. And I was kind of like semi-waking up, you know? Mm -hmm. And it dawned on me that it was an infomercial on. And it was for, um, I don't even know what it was for. And then the next thing that came on was, like, um, one of those, like, Chris, or church, you know, when they, the church services on yeah. televised church yeah. services. And I put the two and two together. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Would you ever consider a, a, an infomercial for life, the live hymnal, once you have, like, the, the first four? Oh, man. Because that could, I, was, I think that could actually be a really <laughs> cool, a really powerful marketing push. I, I have no idea what the what the costs and all that would be, but it would be interesting to explore that. Because think about it, like, I always, anytime I, and it could be my 2.30 in the morning brain, but anytime I see an infomercial, like, I, there's something inside of me that's like, I want that. Must have that. I need that. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I, it speaks to me, especially when I see the ones about music, like, <gasps> They have put every song from the 60s together that I, I love. <laughs> I just like, must have that. <laughs> Our market's really kind of strange. Like, yeah, it's very niche. Yeah. You know, when here's a good example. Yeah. We just played in um, uh, Roanoke, Virginia for mm. 650 lay leaders, vestry members, and priests and it was like at the beginning, before we played note one, they were giving us the death stare. A lady actually told us we were too loud before we even started. <gasps> we didn't play a single note before she said. Was it that. in the in the church? Where what what was the setting? This was in a a this was a diocesan service in. So Southwest it was like within a church, Virginia. though. I no, mean, it's what I mean. In a, in a hotel. Okay. Anyway, um, so by the end of that church service, yeah. They were on their feet, tears in their eyes, hooting and hollering. <laughs> yeah. All the uptight, stick in the mud people were like, uh, you know, grins, you know, bigger than their faces. It was just awesome. That's right? amazing. They left not knowing who we are, though. Mm-hmm. So they left feeling really excited about the church, hopeful about the future. Yeah. You know, really rejuvenated. And conversation over. Two weeks later, uh-huh. we play for half the crowd in um, Cleveland, Ohio, uh-huh. right? 325. And they knew who we were. Mm-hmm. We played a concert 
where we got to speak about who we are and what we do. Right. And after that, it was like gangbusters. <laughs> all these people want what we do at their church. Right. They want to buy the book. They all have the CD now. And we actually sold enough stuff to start working on the next album. Oh, woo! So that sense that you're talking about, yeah. the infomercial thing. Yeah. You know, it's really like doing that on TV doesn't make any sense <laughs> right. because our crowd is sleeping, getting ready for their sermon. You're you know? So right. You're so right. <laughs> they're, going, they're like, you know, the uh, ultra guild people, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but playing for churches that think they want to get into this sort of thing right. is really what we should be doing. Mm. And uh, that's the next step. You know, we need, a, we need an agent, we need a manager who really understands the mainline, yeah. Christian, main, mainline Christian market. Like, how do you get on a little tour in small yeah. churches that would be, in, you know, totally enthused and surprised by yeah. what we're doing. So a lot of my listeners are trying to do things that are fairly unique, mm-hmm. right? Um, how do you get people to get it? How do you communicate that message? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I could if if you were if you were dehydrated, walking in the desert, yeah. and I had a water bottle. Yeah, I could not sell it to you. Mm. Not your thing. I don't know yeah. how to. I don't know yeah. how to sell. Yeah, so, yeah. I just can tell you what I've seen, and, and those past two gigs are a good example of like aha moment for me. You know, like uh, duh, it sells itself when you play to the people who want it yeah yeah <laughs> you know yeah we're interested so, so how do you make those commu- those connections to get in front of a, a size a group of people like that how do you how do you find those targets um i don't know yeah you know if we played at um uh, national events like um bishops gatherings mm-hmm. you know bishops would usually have the budget to to bring us in for you know an event that all their parishes would see and be right. rejuvenated by so on and so forth. Totally, right? totally. That's usually when we play a national event. Right, right. It's, uh, you know, when a bishop actually wants to invest. But typically at these bishops' events, it's, you know, Joe Musician who's just, you know, knows the person booking the thing and got the gig and, you know. Gotcha. They go and they actually, <laughs> funny enough, play praise and worship. right. To a bunch of bishops. Right. Or it's an organist who plays right. the traditional stuff. Right. So we really are the answer. We're, yeah. We're the band that's doing it in the yeah. Episcopal world, at least, you know. Hmm. Um, but Well, let me ask you this. So as a creative person who's trying to pursue a thing, uh-huh. at what point do you feel like it's acceptable to force it to, whether it's a deadline you want to make or, you you know, you want to make sure you have this recording finished by thus and such time. Like, mm-hmm. when is it okay to force that? Hmm. Ah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of a scenario, but I can tell you that that um, creatives like me and probably you, um, though less you because you'll understand the other side of this, mm-hmm. creatives love projects. They love setting up a to-do list and having it, you know, and getting to work on it daily, yeah. but they hate having to do it on a timeline. Right. So forcing a timeline is great for a creative, you know? Mm. Uh, if I had someone saying, look, I need you to get, you know, the guitar parts for these three songs done today, mm-hmm. and tomorrow you're going to do the, the next three, and the next day you're going to do the next three, and the, the next day you're going to edit them all, and you're going to be done with your guitar parts... Uh, I would say you're crazy, but then I would go do it. Right, <laughs> right, know? right. Otherwise, I'm just managing whatever the next emergency is. Right, you know, right. Typical creative. When do you think, um, for someone who's a creative and a perfectionist, that can be a very dangerous combination. Yes, yes. How do you know when to just shut yourself down and just just move on? Oh, God, there's such varying degrees of this. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, uh, we would not have released the first two albums, you know, with complete perfection. Um, uh, but you you definitely, in music, um, you learn, hopefully, <laughs> you learn <laughs> at some point w- what the average person hears yeah. and doesn't hear. Yeah. And you... 
you create an album for that person. Mm -hmm. You don't create an album for your professor in college. <laughs> right, you know, right, right. You don't right, right. create an album for, you know, your your totally studious theology people. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You create an album, you know, and, and that's really what we're doing is we're trying to inspire hearts and bring people closer to God. So, right. you know, we're... We're for our congregation and our people. Yeah. You know, and so that, that helps in the perfectionism, you know, and that helps with any artist, you know, to go back to, like, the heart of the simpleton who's checking you out, you know, walking by your painting, like, oh, maybe that's cool. Yeah. You know, creating something that will catch their eye and lift their heart. So, and for us, it's, you know, catch their ears and lift their heart. That makes sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense because when it comes to <clears throat> podcasting, one thing I've had, I've, I'm making much more of a uh, an effort and to be conscious of mm -hmm. and to I'm trying to keep the perspective of my listeners mm. uh, more than myself. And that was an aha moment. I had a little while back, but it's something I'm still building on and developing, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. because, um, you know, I'm trying to think, especially now and especially because I being at PodFest and actually meeting some of the people who have actually heard me, which was a weird experience, you know, and understanding what they're looking for is more of, okay, this is great. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so now yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. duh, right. Let me <laughs> try to provide that for you. So yes, I'm like, yes, for uh -huh. example, uh, playing with the formats, playing with the audio, trying to figure out what, and so yeah. it's, it's a, it's a tricky game to yeah. get out of my own head of what, um, and trying to concentrate on thinking perfection is only based on my own opinion. Right. I mean, you're you're on your own. You got to wear a lot of hats. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, choose your level of perfectionism with each hat. Right. You know, for me, you know, it, it can literally come down to, you know, how how many toms tom hits on the freaking drum, you know, set that has four toms on it. <laughs> Over in the course of an entire album, how many of those do I want to edit out singly, <laughs> fade in and fade out of? Oh, my gosh. Because you know, that takes a week in itself, just editing toms. Uh, or do I just <laughs> let the, the bleed of those uh, microphones kind of destroy the drum kit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it, once again, it goes back to the common listener. If, if the drums sound anemic, it's because I didn't edit out those freaking toms. Mm. So it's a lot of detail work that is perfectionistic looking. Right, right, right. But in the end, it's like I really care about having an impact. Yeah. You know, they would hear that on a professional album. Mm -hmm. It's kind of what I want to relay. It's a tight sound. Mm -hmm. Multiply that times everything that's in there, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, the 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 cutoff for perfectionism you know is often in in like you <laughs> yeah. know really geeky things that like right. no one's ever going to hear and it's not going to impact their heart right right you know you know it's interesting i was watching uh some behind this this is so random i was watching the behind the scenes of of all things avatar uh, uh -huh. yeah, the yeah. other day a couple weeks cool ago movie. yes yeah and uh, James Cameron, no, uh, who's the the guy who directed it? The James Cameron. Yeah, James Cameron. Yeah. Okay. okay, so he's a perfectionist, right? Uh -huh. And he he did that movie to the yeah. definitive detail, out of place. like it was. Yeah. And when I was watching it, I was like, you know, if anybody had dropped the ball, if anybody had fallen short, if they had kind of cut corners on the foliage, right, uh -huh. in the very background, yeah, or yeah. Yeah, yeah. or yeah, yeah. or decided to make. A few fewer templated clouds, and maybe repeat things a little bit more. <laughs> you may not have noticed, uh -huh. but it would have felt a little bit less authentic. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, uh -huh. and so it's like striking the balance between. If for, I was thinking about how do I apply that to my podcasting? Okay. Uh -huh there's a point where I can edit a lot of ums out. I can edit every single one. <laughs> but does a real conversation ever sound like that? No. No. Right, right, right. So it gets to a point where if I over edit, it yeah. becomes awkward. Right. And I've overshot my target and I've missed the whole point. So <laughs> right. it's it's like, so yeah, it's right. hard to <laughs> Tricky stuff. thing. I mean, you don't want to go James Cameron on your podcast. I no, so. I can't. I'll right. never get it done. No, no. <laughs> we'll be on episode one twelve yeah. next year. Here's the flip side. Like <laughs> today, I was I was at the gym and I was using this machine that actually talks to you, right? Mm -hmm. And I could hear that they recorded the lady who talks to you <laughs> right. without using a pop filter. Yeah, a pop filter can be a a pantyhose. Yeah, like 
It yeah, you're right. 25 cents. You're right. You're right. Use a freaking pop filter. You're right. <laughs> you know? Like, okay, maybe that's perfectionistic. But it's a simple thing. It's a simple yeah. thing. It's professional. Yeah. You know, do it right. You know, I think you, I think you hit it because I think the, the balance is do what you can. Yeah. That's reasonable. Yeah. If totally. It's like, do first the things that are super easy and will have the biggest effect. Yeah. And then go down the line from there. Yeah. Until you just had enough and just push it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chuck. It's been awesome catching up oh, with you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you so much for coming on I'll again. Like Two hundred and oh, whatever. Oh, yeah, something yeah. like that. It's gonna be great. <laughs> I really appreciate it. This Hope you can edit out all my curse words for the church people. Uh, they, know you they, know <laughs> they know you too. They know you too. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Sue. Yay. All right. Woo-hoo. Time for us to bend our thinking on the learning curve. It's takeaway time. Isn't Chuck amazing? (laughs) Please be sure to check him and his music out at livehimmel.com or on iTunes. And to stay tuned to the end of this episode for a little taste of Live Hymnal's latest album, Procession. So today's first learning curve topic is... How to deal with industry changes you never saw coming. I mean, when Charles first began his Live Hymnal project, the industry was still about album sales, not individual downloads. So he's had to figure out a way to respond to all of that. In my case, podcasting is such a young industry by comparison. I can only imagine what big changes are still to come on the horizon. But when that time comes, I'm hoping that the connections I have been nurturing over the years in my field, um, the groups that I belong to, the resources I've become in the habit of mining will keep me not only well informed, but also well equipped to respond. The trick is going to be, how do I stay ahead of the curve? No pun intended. Well, pun intended. (laughs) Right now, I'm still in catch-up mode, building up my skills and experience in general, but I think that regularly engaging in conversation, workshops, and other peer think opportunities will encourage that creative thinking when the time comes. And of course, building that network will also provide a lot of the support we will all need in those times. Who knows? Perhaps keeping those creative juices flowing and keeping an eye focused on where the road can bend ahead of you will lead you, yes, you, I'm pointing at you, to be the change that your industry next sees. I mean, how cool will that be? So stay connected, stay in constant conversation with your peers in the industry. The second topic is how do you get your your unique thing to be what people say, I must have that. What is it that they need to know about you? What is the first thing you need to communicate when an audience is giving you the death stare? Well, it's not necessarily the thing itself, but the feeling you want them to have. Charles talked about what a difference there was between when his audience had no idea what to expect and then after when they had experienced a little bit of the live hymnal magic. There was a feeling there that they had captured and would then want to turn to live hymnal over and over again to recapture. So how do I or you or anyone else apply this to to practice for our own thing? Well, you have to really think about what you want your audience to gain from having experienced you. And yes, I mean you, not your thing. Because ultimately, they may come for music, for example, but they come back for the experience that only you can give them. And that is especially powerful the more unique your thing is. Unfortunately, the more unique your thing is, the harder it is to find your target audience, but that is a whole other topic for future discussion because we can really dive in deep into that. So how do you boil down what you're doing and distill it into a feeling? Well, as much as I've tried thinking before about what I want Curve the Cube to be for people and how I want it to affect their lives, I didn't really get it until I took myself out of it, really, and I'm still working on it. But, I mean, how do I, I had to think about how do I want someone to feel after they listen to an episode? Well, I want them to feel inspired, 
to discover what they're passionate about, do what they love, and believe that they can work around the obstacles. Ultimately, I want people to believe in themselves and then apply that belief to a more authentic path and purpose in their own lives. We were not all meant to spend years upon years of our lives doing otherwise. Then the natural question is, what do my listeners truly need to hear to feel that? And I've boiled that down to three things, as of now at least, right? It's all, always fluid. One, examples of other curvists doing their things, such as the wonderful Charles Milling. <laughs> Insights into my own ongoing journey that honestly shares just how hard this is. So people can know that if I can do it, so can you. Yes, you. And tips and tricks to give my listeners, you, clear action items that you can employ. This last one, I'm also doing a lot of uh, now on social media, so be sure to follow Curve the Cube on all the intersocial cells. Um, so you have to think about what are those things that you need to put into your thing <laughs> to elicit that kind of reaction, that kind of feeling into the people you're trying to attract. Um, so really take some time to think about what those things might be for you. And our third topic on today's learning curve is, well, as a creative, how do you know when it's okay to set aside your pursuit of something being perfect and just push a project out already? <laughs> we all know what it's like to get so hung up on the details that we never really move forward. I mean, it's a great question. Oh my goodness. And it's a question with absolutely no right answer. Yay. <laughs> so I would suggest taking a deep look at yourself and being honest about how anal you are and how perfect you pressure yourself to be. Then balance that with the productivity you realistically need in order to keep moving forward. Remember, this podcast is all about putting action behind your passion. So if you are stuck on one project, trying to get the perfect thesis for your article, trying to edit out every um from a podcast, or trying to get the perfect fades and fade outs for every single last Tom Tom, <laughs> you will never finish. Well, at least you'll probably never stay as productive as you need to actually grow a career, right? So what to do? Well, first of all, commit to letting go of the guilt. Now. It's a lot better to produce a song that's 95% exactly as you want and start working on another and move forward than it is to take twice as much time working out the nitty gritty of that last 5% of your perceived perfection. <laughs> right? <laughs> and if it is the guilt of not being perfect that is holding you back, you need to let that go right now. Repeat after me. No one will know. So, you better have repeated that. <laughs> I'm serious. To recap. One, stay closely connected to ties in the industry and keep a constant think tank around you. Two, think about what your audience, your audience, not you, your audience needs in order to get that unique feeling you want them to experience from whatever it is that you're doing. And three, don't let perfection bog down your forward progress. Remember, it doesn't truly exist anyway. And that is today's learning curve. You have successfully curved the cube. Curve the Cube podcast is where dreamers become doers. Through this passion project of mine, your host, Jemmy Lagagnier, moi, will inspire you to pursue your own dreams by taking you on an intimate tour of my own journey crafting a dream career. I provide powerful takeaways and action items for you to put into play in changing your own life. Along the way, I talk to other curvists who are doing the same to demystify the process that you too can follow. 
From actors to artists, musicians to business owners, underwater photographers to crafty creators, and everything in between, Curve the Cube will inspire you to pursue your own dreams and passions. Find your passion, do your thing with the Curve the Cube podcast. Enjoy! Chosen.